Everybody gives themselves 100% credit for their successes and blames other people for their failures, regardless of who contributed to what happens when you fall. It's an opportunity to reflect and be like, how did that happen? And what can I do differently? All right, so I have a quote from Marcus Aurelius that I think you might relate to, or you can tell me if you relate to it. So he says, <clears throat> in meditations, he says, the rock gains nothing by being thrown up and it loses nothing by coming back down. Uh, I wonder if that jives with your experience. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like a very Zen kind of approach to the ups and downs of life. And that's something I'm sure we'll get into and something we all have experience with. Um, and there's, yeah, it's almost like no risk, no reward. It's like the inverse of that in a weird way. Yes. Yeah. Well, you're, I mean, you had very big ups, right? Like when people go like, uh, how, how are you doing? And you're like, well, I have a company that's made, making a hundred million dollars a year and I've been on the cover of Forbes magazine. That seems like as good as it can get. Uh, and then yeah, it, it goes. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was amazing. It was the best. W was it, it was the best or did it feel like, so it goes up really fast and it, it comes down somewhat precipitously, not, not to zero. So I'm not like, you're not yeah. like Elizabeth Holmes or something. I'm not trying to apply, imp uh, imply this, but I'm just saying you, 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 you rode a very big wave and then that wave came crashing down. How, how does that feel to a person? Like, does it, is Marcus right that it, it doesn't actually mean anything? It doesn't change you? Or, or was your experience different? I think it changes you in that, like, the rock on its way up doesn't have the level of periphery that the rock on its way down does. Mm. And it's really not in, like, the rise that you see what's hiding out that you only see at low tide. Um, and it's that kind of perspective that can inform what happens for the rest of your life. I think success is so fun. I had the best ride, but also in a lot of ways, success makes you lazy. Um, and everybody gives themselves a hundred percent credit for their successes and like, you know, blames other people for their failures. Sure. And regardless of who contributed to what happens when you fall, it's it's important to just take a hundred percent responsibility personally to learn what you can, even from the shortcomings of the people who contributed to it. Um, and just assume that even if there's misinformation out there, right? I've had a lot of headlines. Um, there's something to learn from it. Sure. Because even if it's an echo of a sentiment of an employee that you no longer even work with from years ago that winds up in a roundup of some press thing like years later, it's an opportunity to reflect and be like, how did that happen? And what can I do differently for that not to happen again? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 clearly something that the Stokes were thinking a lot about, being that they they held a lot of I think I think it probably comes from holding elected office, right? You you win and you're powerful and then you lose and all of that goes away. So there's this sense of going up and down probably. Uh although Zeno, the, the founder of Stoicism, he loses everything in a shipwreck. He he's this uh uh, dealer in, in, in what they call Tyrian purple, this sort of dye that, that comes from the Mediterranean. And he loses everything in the shipwreck. He washes up in Athens. Um, he, would, he would say later, you know, I made a great fortune when I suffered a shipwreck because it sort of changes the course of his life. But it does feel like the Stoics had this, had some sense of the ride that you've been on, which is that you were very celebrated and then the parade stopped. It stopped, but it didn't stop. Like, it, I think it, you know, I left my first company and I kept going. Like, nothing really stopped for me. Sure. And I think it's like, does everything even stop? Or is everything an enzyme for whatever happens next? 
and maybe it's not for everybody, but what didn't stop was the fact that on my way up, I inspired a generation of people and women and entrepreneurs who probably from the time I wrote my first book, Girl Boss in 2014, who were like, yay, we're all like going for it, had experienced their own setbacks by the time I faced public setbacks and it gave them permission to experience those as well, because that's not something that people talk about personally in the same way. And so I feel like my story is just some, you know, pretty common example of things that everybody endures, but doesn't necessarily talk about. And those women have followed me and there was not a blip in their kind of support of me as, you know, I experienced the down, whatever from the up. And then when I left Nasty Gal at the end of 2016, I put on a conference and it sold out in two weeks for 500 women. And in like March of 2017, like I didn't stop. I saw what was happening. It was already happening. I just moved into that space and occupied it with something that I knew people wanted that felt honestly a lot more relevant than and rewarding than Nasty Gal at that point. And I had stopped already, like when it ended. Interesting. It's hard to, it's hard to, I know that maybe someone who worked for me could be listening, but personally as an entrepreneur, there was some relief in the end because unless you're like board controls the business or which mine didn't, you can't quit and you can't be fired. And that was this kind of purgatory I was in for years that, you know, the kind of like end of the era of Nasty Gal and the changing of the hands into another kind of owner of the business was really kind of in some ways the only opportunity that I had to move on when I was already ready to move on. Well, I guess it, it depends on what you identify with as the going up or the going down, right? That may be another way to think about it. So if one's identification of, of success or being up is the top line revenue or the tenor of the press or whether you're on covers or not, then, then you know, it's a pretty clear up and down. But also if one, but instead, if one is identifying with positive change or impact on other people or self-actualization or any of these things, then actually it's more of an, uh, a, a sort of a straight line equilibrium that, that, that's not fluctuating wildly. It was successful the whole time. So I guess it comes down to how one defines success, which the Stokes would say has to be rooted much more in the things that we control or much less about you know, whether other people think we're a success and more about like what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to say it wasn't hard. Yeah. Right. To be this like millennial entrepreneurial outlier, golden child, female example of what was possible uh, and this freak story of a community college dropout who built a business that did a hundred million dollars in revenue, uh, and was, you know, held up as a hero. And then when things went sideways was held accountable to, you know, every, every single thing that could have happened in the business. And, you know, I said this on, and I joined a podcast recently with the morning brew called the crazy ones. And I said this, it's like one thing nobody knows when you're starting a business is that you probably only know 10% of what's happening in your business. I mean, this is when it, you've got some scale and people, but you're held accountable to a hundred percent of it. Sure. And like the Delta between what you know and what you're held accountable to is really hard. And it's not something you can necessarily even, see coming and to be then on the other side, the example of like, she's not a girl boss, 
because I didn't like pull it off. Like I built like a culture or didn't build a culture, accidentally built a company culture that like could have been better, but I had never even worked in an office. I'd never experienced leadership. I had absolutely no understanding of what people needed to be successful. You know, it was like the tower of Babel, uh, hiring a hundred people in a year. Uh, and that cute serendipitous story that inspired so many people, you know, kind of like hit its ceiling in terms of my understanding of what it takes to really scale a business. Um, and it's, you know, to this day, it's not like I don't operate from a place where, you know, I, I know what's possible and the eyeballs that are on me and that the next thing better be a hit. And, you know, that, you know, understand like chasing relevance and, you know, egotistical bullshit like that, that comes up. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, everything's the same. I live in the same place. I have the same friends. I'm the same. I'm better. That's why I like, that's why I like the quote. I I think it applies here, right? Is at the end of the day, uh, you're the same person. And so, so, you know, you don't, nothing really changes by going up and changing and changes by coming down. Not, not the things that really matter anyway. Because there's another, there's another version of the quote where he says, because he returns to in meditations, he says, receive without arrogance, let go with indifference, which to me is sort of the prescription for the formula of, a, uh, of a, in a world where one can be extremely successful very quickly and then extremely controversial or deal with adversity or struggle or a reversal in some way just as quickly. I mean, I think the bigger risk in changing as a person is by winning. Like the bigger risk is that you become, I mean, I've seen it with friends. You're like hanging out on yachts with like billionaires. Like who are your friends? Why are they friends with you? Like if I was worth, you know, if I actually pocketed the hundreds of millions of dollars that I was worth on paper, who would I be? I don't think I'd like that person. So I've like preserved myself in ways and been able to, I think, live in reality in ways that, you know, had my story, had I pulled it all off, I, I think I could be a lot more lost than I am. Interesting. Yeah. Tennessee Williams talks about the catastrophe of success and there is a kind of catastrophe that happens. I think if you are successful beyond a certain level, like my, my books have sold very well. And then I'll meet someone who like blows up at a whole other level and usually the first thing that goes is the marriage, you know, their health stuff. Like you, you look at them and you're like, I'm not actually yeah. sure. They I mean, like maybe this is just polygamy to their wife. It's like every yeah. tech bro is like, and then they get a divorce and they like find someone younger and they're probably still like, you can date me, but I'm just going to do whatever I want and go to sex. Par-. Like, that's it. Like you tap out at like, it's like you need like to your kink has to be edgier like in life, you know, you got to eat rarer food and drink rarer wine and, you know, get like, you know, get your dick stomped on to like get off or like, you know, that being the kind of like (laughs) parallel to what happens in your life when you like have everything, like what's left, like nothing, you don't feel anything anymore. And we can buy anything because I kind of could for a while. Nothing matters. There's no value to anything. Like, it's like, what's, what's left? Like, at my peak when I was whatever, 27, 28, 29, I was like actually worried that there was nothing more. Was really? Just, like really naive. But yeah, there were times where I was like, is this, is this like, is this it? Not in a sad way. Like I wanted more, but like, can, is there an up from here? And if you're kind of an adrenaline junkie, uh, or a, a, a feeling junkie, as I think a lot of driven people are, that's probably the most terrifying thing that there is. Yeah. Like what does things just like plateau from here? And I'm just like this person because Ugh. like, it doesn't get better. Right. Oh man. So I've got well, like a, I've got like the runoff of that and it's great. Life is great. 
you you want to be successful, but you want not to be catastrophically successful. I think it makes people weird. It does. I've said this before. I think the harder thing to do is to be very successful or very good at what you do and not become like a monster. Yeah, it's hard. You better get a good executive coach or therapist or like wife or kids or, you know, or all of that hobby or, you know, illness, maybe. (laughs) Yeah, you you have to you have to like the 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 weight of the power, success, press, attention, responsibility, stress, etc., is so great that if there's not a counterbalance to it, I think you spin off the planet. Also, it like ages you. So if you like, you're just like, I'm like, would I ever want to run a public company? I'm like, fuck, how would that show up for me? I live in Los Angeles. Very stoic. Yes. But you think about things like that, at least when you're a woman with like hair extensions or whatever. Oh, you mean like who you would have to be uh, superficially to sort of fit into that club? No, just like what are the health effects of Hmm. dealing with that level of stress? And then also like how much does it show up on your face prematurely? (laughs) Just as a vain aside, I've had that. I have had that consideration. Well, you know what? I thought about that earlier today. So I, they did this little magazine profile. Austin Monthly did this little magazine profile of, of me opening the bookstore. And they had sent a photographer out um, to take a picture of me. And, you know, I saw the picture and I was like, oh, so that's what this is doing to me. Like, uh, it was like, it was the first photo I've seen in a long time where I was like, I look much older than I remember looking. <laughs> yeah. No, that's like. At a certain point, it's like, I'm just going to like get veneers because I'll just be happier with the photo. Like it's literally efficient. Mm -hmm. Like it's like I care less about what the photo looks like because I like am happier that like it doesn't look like I grind my teeth and have like a my teeth were fine. Mm -hmm. But stuff like that is like actually practical when you're getting photographed all the time because you're just like want to be like, cool, great, moving on. Well, but also your peer group changes and your peer group is doing all of those things. And then you start to think, well, why do I look different than those people? Do you know what I mean? You're so, like you talked about the, the CEO, like let, plastic surgery aside or, or whatever. Um, but you, you, you go, but all my friends have a house that looks like X. All the, you know, you start to get a, it, it, it's hard to resist the pull of keeping up with the Joneses, even when you're at a certain level. And I think you, you, you know, stuff just gets normalized. You're like, oh, so-and-so is flying on a private jet to go on a vacation to here. And then that seems normal to you, even though it's not normal at all. You want to hear something sad? Yes. I have a friend who's like engaged to a billionaire uh, who has a, she is a startup that's valued at over a billion dollars. And I live in Kauai part-time. And they came and they visited. They didn't like visit me. We were there at the same time. And so we hung out and I stopped by their like rental on the water and their chef cooked us food. And she, I was like, oh, how was your flight? And she was like, oh, we flew private. And I was like, man, I don't really want more. Like, I don't want more. It's a problem. In my, it's actually a problem. Like, I don't want yeah. more. And I'm kind of lost because I don't want more. Uh, but that would be great. Like that's Mm -hmm. one thing that just would be so convenient. But again, like whatever, uh, diamond medallion. (laughs) Um, and she was like, yeah, I mean, it's the best. I would live in like a $2 million home if it meant I could keep flying private. And I was like, whoa, wow. You're so out of touch. This is scary. And I like made a joke. I'm like good at yeah. like, you know, cajoling people without insulting them. And I don't know if it brought her any <coughs> level of self-awareness, but it is an example of, you know, the freak show of success. It is. It's super, it's super weird. Uh, flying too, I think. Uh, I've, I've flown private a few times and it's definitely much, 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 much better uh, 
I don't know if it's so much better that I would ever pay for it, but uh, I, I certainly don't mind when other people are paying yeah. for it. But yeah. um, it is one of the few things that uh, everyone, you know, with the exception of the very, very few people that fly private, it's one of the, the last places on earth that everyone is equal, like the airport, right? Like it just fucking sucks for everyone. Even if you have status on an airline, even if you can go in the lounges, it just sucks, right? And so like, there is probably something to be said about maintaining parts of your life that suck and connect you to the suckiness of life that everyone else is experiencing. Yeah, there was a time where like, everyone was doing everything for me. And I was like a baby. Mm -hmm. Like I had like Tom Cruise's ex assistant and paid her like 130 grand a year. And she like showed up and like, I didn't even know people did this, but this is just like what she was trying to do and what she did. She like packed my suitcase on trips. She like made a whole duplicate of toiletries of stuff that I used at home. And she had an inventory of it and she'd replace stuff if I ran out of it. Like I, we flew together she, I literally just like stared at my phone walking through an airport and she like pulled my ID out of my bag. When we got to the counter, she checked us in, she navigated us to the gate and I was just like, boop, 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 boop. She carried my bag. We got to the Crosby hotel. She, uh, gets to, I could go straight to a meeting. She'd have yeah. my shit. She would like unpack me, steam my shit, put my laptop on the desk, plug it in, put my tampons in a cup in the bathroom, everything. And I, she would order room service for me the next morning. She would show up, wake me up. If I had like an early morning, she'd unlock my room and she'd turn the shower on and be like, okay. And open the curtains and be like, it's time to start your day. Yeah. Like I had a full-time housekeeper for six years who like, when I had to run, she would like go at like 8 a.m. before I had to drive to work and like gas up my car. I didn't go to a gas station for years. And like pre Instacart, like my fridge was always stocked. Like, you know, my bag on the counter, here's what I need. I need this, 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 this. And if it's scattered, it's what it's not when I have to leave in the morning, it's just like grab the shit and go. Like it was crazy. It was crazy. And I realized when I, stopped working with that assistant and no longer had a full-time housekeeper. I was like, fuck, like I, I was like a big baby. Like I'm a really capable person. Mm -hmm. And this, I realized like how much pride I have in being a really capable person and how um, kind of rewarding it is to just do stupid shit and solve your own problems. Like how to like hack like an airport thing that nobody else knows about or whatever. And, um, that kind of resourceful, when that kind of resourcefulness, like only exists in your business, it's like, I don't know, it's kind of boring. Did that go away suddenly or was it gradual? Like, was it a re-entry or was no, it a she left overnight? and I had another amazing assistant and then nasty gal ended. And then I hired my own assistant, but it wasn't. It wasn't like a super senior assistant. I have, I didn't have a senior assistant for like a year later when I started my second company girl boss. Um, but not, not really, you know, now I drive an electric car and it just like charges itself. So <laughs> whatever. I, I think about that. I actually have a chapter about this in the discipline book. Um, there's a story about Martin Luther King. Uh, he, he's, he's, uh, his wife, Coretta, is called by the actor Harry Belafonte. And, um, you know, she's on the phone and she's like cooking dinner and answering the door and tending to the children, just all this stuff. And he's like, I have to ask, like, do you have help? And she was like, no, Martin would never allow it. Right. And Martin did have help. It was his wife, right? He just didn't allow her to have help. And and Harry Belafonte is like, this ends now. Like, I'm hiring a staff for you and I'm going to pay for it. And it's this breakthrough because he's like, I want you guys to be focused on the movement, not like, is there milk in the fridge? So I think people have a balance. Uh, uh, th that's a difficult balance for people to strike. Some people are way too independent and they don't outsource and staff and bring people on to make things easier for them. And then certain people have either so much resources or they're so uh, entitled that they have everyone do everything for them. And the middle ground is where you want to be. Like yeah. my, my wife and I, um, 
we sometimes we just look at our lives and we're like, we're doing too much. And the result is our marriage isn't as good or our, we're not spending enough time with our kids because we're not doing it. And yeah. like, we, we, we have been trying to staff up. But the other thing we've been looking at is like, also, are we just doing too much? Like maybe the sta- maybe the thing isn't yeah. to what is have this noise. So- yeah, it's not to have someone travel with you, but maybe just agree to go on fewer business trips. Yeah. Um, I just hired an assistant after a like pretty long hiatus and it's a little risky because business class, which is my entrepreneurship program that I teach twice a year, you know, business is down, like people left, you know, it's COVID they're traveling. Sure. So that is what it is across all kind of educational online, online educational businesses. Yeah. And I, but my, I got a brand new roof. It leaked the first time it rained. There's a bucket in my hallway. I think I have to sue these people. My dishwasher broke this, the faucet, the sprayer broke. We just has to, had to replace that. We replaced the dishwasher. My curtains were broken. Uh, there's like, I have to file like a police report for a storage unit that got broken into and everything stolen from trying to transfer my ex filed an insurance claim on a car that like on my insurance, whatever, don't whatever. Um, all this shit happened at once. And I was like, holy shit, like this is taking up half my time. Yeah. And I wasn't able to work. And sometimes when you like, and a lot of the time when I like cast something out and make a promise, like spend something on someone. This happened with my first employee. I was like, I don't know if I can afford her or keep her busy full time. And so as soon as that happens, like your life expands to the level that you've committed. Yeah. And like, I just made up like what business class like didn't like make this year Yeah. in like a two month period. Right. And I've like paid for him time, you know, a few sure. times over in like a couple months. Right. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It froze for a second. I just wanted to make sure you weren't still talking. I just stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I tend to find that too. I have, I have never once hired a person and then been like, uh, I can't, con- I, I don't have enough work for this person. It's almost always needing another person after. And then I, f- then I look back and I go, I was abusing the people that I hired before because I was making one person do what is clearly five people's jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I almost feel guilty every time I hire someone because they, so cl- it so clearly becomes a full-time uh, person's job to take whatever I hand off to them. And then I go, how, how was I doing this with no people before or only But also two even before? worse, like when your team is at scale, like bloat is like a real thing. And you don't sure. like know you're bloated until you like lay people off or fire someone and like the rest of the team absorbs it. And you're like, and, and some, and that's just like no sweat for them sometimes. Like sometimes they like resent it, but like, you know, this doesn't happen with smaller teams, but with larger teams, it's like, wow, like, what was I doing? How dare I, you know? How do, dare I have let this happen? Um, but you fire a low performer and you realize, oh, shit, they weren't doing anything. Yes. And that that's on true. you. That's on you. I was I was talking to Gary Vaynerchuk about this recently where like the other thing I struggle with, maybe you do too. So you you hire staff or whatever. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm doing this now in addition to all my other stuff. And then I'm handing it off to this person and they're like struggling with the workload of it. And you're just like, wait, I was doing this two hours a week and doing just fine. And somehow you have 40 hours a week and you're like too busy. You can't take on anything more. And so I go back and forth between like having very high standards and then empathy going like, hey, maybe I really can do in two hours what it takes someone else 40 hours a week. And then other times I get resentful and I just go, what the fuck? Like this can't be that hard. Yeah. No, I mean, people join and they're like, I have a career and I'm senior and I'm used to having a team and I don't execute. I like do strategy. Like I've been at this so long that I'm an expert that I'm just like unwilling to execute. And then like, they need to hire people to actually execute. And you're like, wait, how did I just build an 
organization when I needed someone to do one thing. And that's like, yes. it's dangerous to hire someone and then train them. And it's time consuming if they're like more junior, but you hire someone more senior and you have that happen. And you're just like, I hate this. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah. And, and, and I'm just like, I'm also like, I can't burn any more people out. I think that's what that keeps happening. I keep hiring people and then they, they make it a few months and then they burn out. And I'm just like, either I'm a monster, which I don't want to be, we're just talking about, or people just can't, can't cut it, you know? And, uh, I think they it, overcomplicate things like just be scrappy. It's not hard. Yes. It's just not, you don't need to push things around that aren't the thing just like do the essential things but again yeah. same same as i said like your life will expand your pants will expand to like you buy bigger pants like that i'm just like i won't buy bigger pants i'll just figure it out you know but like also you hire someone and like they're gonna make enough work to expand to like whatever they're just you know it's like it's not their job to drive efficiencies if there isn't that much work for them it's their job to prove to you that they're busy right what if and you fill, really and fill that time what if you're just walking around in uncomfortable pants all the time and just slightly bigger ones would be a, a gift to yourself uh it's just not it's not something i do <laughs> It's expensive yes. to buy new clothes and I'd rather have a camel toe than buy, than like buy a bigger size. So, so what was harder for you? Some of the professional setbacks or the personal setbacks? I know you've talked, I'm not just like speculating about your personal life, but you talked about, you know, your marriage falling apart basically right around the same time as nasty gal. So what, what hit you harder? Yeah. So, uh, harder it just felt like it all kind of was part of the same thing like it was just so much noise that it was hard to like disaggregate anything that was happening at the time and while like nasty gal had done some layoffs or whatever like i was still like you know and forbes was like you know hey we estimate your net worth this we want to put you on the cover and i was like cool sounds great you know if this company doesn't work out that's such a big kind of up like and this was in earlier in 2016 you know months before we filed for chapter 11 and i was like yes i just say yes to things to like write a story that's sure. going to be entertaining for me like it's totally dangerous it's really like not strategic but i'm like this is super entertaining like i get to talk about this when i'm old like that happened um, and so in June of 2016, I was on the cover of Forbes as one of America's richest self-made women. Uh, and then in July of 27, 2016, my husband of like, it was just like, we were together for like five years and you married me like eight months ago. Like, what are you doing? Like, what? What? Oh, it was so expensive. The wedding was so expensive. The divorce wasn't expensive because I had an ironclad prenup. <laughs> And TMZ, like, like who cares? But like TMZ has an office inside of the courthouse in LA and they just look for divorce filings. And they were like, nasty gal founder files for divorce, pays X a pittance. And I was like, <laughs> this is funny. Like, yeah. Okay. This is funny. Um, and then six months later, Nasty Gal happened. Nasty Gal kind of fell apart, sold for $20 million in chapter 11. Okay. So like, yeah, whatever. I didn't make it, but like, it's still like such a huge accomplishment. I'm so proud. Yes. Um, like it was worth that at its worst. And then, and we filed on the day Trump was elected. So there was all this like women's stuff, like, oh my sure. God, Hillary could be a thing. And then like my company fell apart the day Trump was elected. And it was like, oh my God, this guy grabbed him by the, what? Like, yeah. this is our president. Like, and then the whole women's movement happened. Um, and me too. And girl boss was like a very simplistic view of like my story. It wasn't like an example of all women. I wasn't sure. speaking for all women. I didn't even talk about being a woman in the book. It's just called girl boss. Right. It was just my story and some advice. And 
then I became like held kind of, it was just kind of like being a woman was like highly, like super politicized. And they were like, speak on behalf of all women. And I was like, I've never worked in an office. I yeah. can't talk about like the wage gap, but why, why, what help? Um, and I started girl boss, my second company around. And I told you, I just kind of went straight into that. Like hosted the first conference brands did partnerships with me. You know, we did over a million dollars in brand partnerships four months after my company fell apart. So it wasn't, I wasn't like doomed, but yeah. what really snowballed and what was really the noisiest was that in April of 2017, again, four months around the time I held the girl boss rally or conference, uh, I, a Netflix series came out about my life right? called girl boss and the character's name was Sophia. She was starting an eBay store, uh, in San Francisco, uh, and the company was called nasty gal. And I had left nasty gal four years prior or four months prior. And here's this show that is telling 140 million viewers in 195 countries about this person named Sophia starting a company called nasty gal. When after 10 years of being involved, I'm four months out of it and like trying to move on. Right. So, and then, and then of course there had been press about like, is she a girl boss? Her company fell apart. There was already that up until the show. Then there's this scripted comedy adaptation of like this exaggerated version of who I am out in the world and the amount of like, and, and literally there's, I had been criticized, but TV shows, like they're literal j- critics. Like it's like their job, like there's, and that's, you know, what happened when a show came out, I've had so much press and I've never seen the amount of press that television or entertainment generates. And there were headlines like the worst thing about Netflix's girl boss is its source material. Ugh. And it was just like, wait, am I the... F- author of girl boss. Am I a CEO or am I this character on Netflix? And you know, what of these things do people think I am? And it all became super conflated. And it was at that point that I was, it was just this kind of like onslaught identity kind of crisis in a way, but I just like kept going. Like I'm a beast sure. and that's just like what I do. But like personally, I'd say that was the hardest point. Yeah, my my first book got optioned to be a reality show and then it got optioned to be a TV show and then a movie. And I sometimes think back to that my my biggest break was that none of those things got made. Yeah, if you're young and someone's making a show about your life, like it's like, okay, yeah. if you're like whoever some like old at the person, end of your life yes at the end of your life but telling your story in the middle of it and like marking that place in time um when you're still telling your story and you're still building your stories like really weird and it doesn't really happen a lot you know it can't be good for the ego right like i don't think many people leave that success or failure of the project more well adjusted than when they went into it Definitely not. And I was not unhappy when the show was canceled, even though I loved the process. But, um, you know, there were definitely comments. That, there's so many people love the show, but there were definitely comments on the Internet that were that were like, you know, it was the beginning. The first season was like starting an eBay store. Yay. They were like, can't wait for the next season. Ugh. You know, they were just like, yeah. can't wait for the rest of the story. Like, <laughs> I never I don't know. Please. No. Yeah, it, it it must be weird too because you were kind of this symbol, like where everyone was rooting for you, and then uh, culturally we have it feels like culturally we have trouble rooting for women on a sustained basis. We can do it in the short term, mm-hmm. and then uh, obviously I'll, the underdog uh, story is is a perennial one for a reason. But it feels like we root for women for a while, just enough making them just big enough that we can really viciously turn on them. Yeah, absolutely. There's fewer of us. And so there's fewer of us to like hold up as heroes and there's fewer of us to show, you know, be made an example of when things go sideways. Yeah. Um, You don't see 
the CEO of a, you know, multi-billion dollar company being skewered because he like laid off a bunch of women or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, not a girl boss. And it's like, guess what? Like I'm trying to run my company responsibly. Like there will be, uh, there will be, what's the word? People who are affected by that in negative ways. And that's something that's really serious and a responsibility that I take very seriously, but it's also like, this is running a business. Like there are ups and downs. Yeah. I had a bloated business. I had commitments to investors. I owned a lot of the company and I had commitments to the rest of the employees who stuck around. I preserved sure. their jobs by cutting heads and you don't see the CEO of whatever company Pinterest, you know, if they did, you know, Twitter, right. It's not going to be like Elon Musk is a misogynist. It's like, you know, Elon Musk is like a crazy, <laughs> like, like, you know, he's a whole bunch of yeah. other things. There, there are sure. louder things to, you know, call him probably, but you just like, don't hear that. And people take female founders down with such glee and it's super misogynistic. I do think that where there are, where there is, you know, smoke, there's fire. And as we saw during the Me Too movement, like, people have to be made examples of yeah. for there to be an archetype that people like don't no longer, that is no longer accepted. Sure. And sometimes that is a much larger kind of like fall <coughs> or criticism than that person even really deserves. Sure. And this is coming, you know, whatever. I'm not like a survivor of anything other than my own kind of, mind. But so speaking from my perspective, like, you know, there was, there was a lot that happened during that time that were, you know, unfair, exaggerated examples of people who had done stuff that was like, this is just what people did like 30 years ago and it's totally not okay. But like, are they sure. doing it anymore? Like give, give them a break. Um, and I think that had to happen with, it didn't really have to happen with me. But it did happen with some of these like women owned businesses, these startups who, you know, had had been, you know, heralded as these kind of heroes in a in a, a few years after I had been. And during Black Lives Matter, there was just this whole like slate of female founders that were just like taken literally everyone. Yeah. It was like Glossy's racist, Away's racist. Uh the Museum of Ice Cream's racist. The Reformation's racist. I mean, she, I mean, there's like photos of her like eating fried chicken, like, like whatever, like there's serious shit. Um, and like, you know, employees, you know, with the wing, it was like, they made an Instagram account called flew the coup. Like it was like a coup of employees. Yeah. Glossier had something called out of the gloss. Cause their, her original blog was called, into the gloss and there were some examples made, but I think it was, you know, I think for the most part, they were really extreme examples and a lot of value was destroyed in those businesses. Um, and I guess you mentioned Elizabeth Holmes at the top of this episode and I almost stopped you and was like, please don't even mutter that name. Like, right. stop, like stop, like sure. stopped. Um, so stop. Um, like three days ago, the information, this like highly respected news subscription base, like it's like 150 or $200 a year tech, like tech news. Like they like, you know, have exclusives. They, you know, it's the people who subscribe to it are serious. They had like a weekend edition where they did a roundup of Halloween cost tech, tech inspired Halloween costumes that you could be for Halloween. And one of them was like basically like disgraced girl boss. Like yes. I wrote the book eight years ago. I yeah. stepped down out, hated it as the CEO at nasty gal in 2015. Like I left nasty gal in 2016. And then I built an amazing culture at girl boss after that. Yeah. When we did layoffs that time, I got thank you letters, like totally different culture. Nobody knows this. And this long, this far later, like 
And this is a woman owned publication. I emailed Jessica Lesson, didn't hear back from her. Audrey from the wing emailed Jessica Lesson, didn't hear back from her. Jessica. Yeah. The founder. And it's a picture of Audrey who founded the co-founder of the wing wearing wings that were singed at the ends. And it was like girl boss too close to the sun, which is like a meme. And I actually think it's kind of funny because yeah. I did girl boss too close to the sun and yeah. inspired people to go like, you know, be way too ambitious and fuck up. And that's fine. Um, better than never having tried. And, and it says like, dress up as your favorite disgraced girl boss, like Audrey Gelman, Sophia Amoruso or Elizabeth Holmes. And this is like this long after everything. Right. And it's just like to be made a caricature this many years later, having like moved on and done really great things and made a huge impact, continued with women, also with entrepreneurs broadly with business class. Um, it's just like, it's shocking that that's still happening. And, um, and to be lumped in with Elizabeth Holmes, like I can't, it's just like, I'm, I don't even want to say that name again because I feel like I'm, doing that by saying her name it's just like it's just like super fucked up well no I'm, fucked up. I'm sorry for even bringing up the name because i was trying to make the exact opposite point that you made later which is that i know i know you you had a business that was successful and then even when it closed or it sold like even it's its scrap parts were worth uh, a significant amount of money right which is very different than what it was uh essentially a, a, a multi-billion dollar fraud uh, perpetrated on the public and on investors. And that is, that is bullshit uh, and must be frustrating, but also so out of your control that you've had to just like shake your head and keep moving, I imagine. Yeah, I think what's challenging on an existential level is moving past like who I think I am and being reminded of like who a few people think I am. Like Sure. People, the million people who s follow me across social media channels, they don't think of that. My friends, they don't think of it. They've all moved right. on. But then there's like the clickbaity media who like whatever, for whatever reason, you know, does this stuff. So like I'm trying to move on. And then, and most people don't have this, like these outside like entities not letting them move on. Sure. If they do, they're friends and you yeah. like dump them or it's your parents and you're just like, sure. I don't want to talk to you or whatever. Yeah. But I am like not allowed to do that. And that is, that's a little bit, that's really challenging. Yeah. There's a, a passage in meditations where Marcus really says that, and this is, I think the curse of politics, leadership, success, whatever he says, um, uh, kingship is earning a bad reputation doing good deeds. So the point is like you do what you think is right. You do what you do and uh, people still dislike you for it or criticize you for it or label you something for it. And it's super disorienting, uh, as you said, when you c also have people who really like what you do and you have a good reputation with them. It's just like, like imagine being like, I don't know, a Nickelback or something. You have these like fans who love you. And then you have these like what we would call elites who hate you. And you exist in a world where both those things are simultaneously being bombarded at you at all times. I mean, it's also why Marcus Aurelius is just like, don't be a king. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> like, exactly. You don't want to be a king. <laughs> yes. You don't want this. No. Um. So as you, uh, having gone through what you've gone through, how has it changed your definition of what success is? I imagine you've experienced a lot of different lives, right? Mm -hmm. What is the life that you're like, that's what I want my life to be. That's what success is. Because you've have, started other no businesses and you have one now. I have no idea. Like I wanted to have kids for like eight years and I tried with two different guys. And now I'm like, I have a boyfriend, but I'm like, shit, I'm 38. Like, do I want that? Like, they seem like, that seems like really challenging or like, you know, I'm just like, I like took the ride from there to here mm -hmm. and I don't want to take a ride. I want to be really deliberate with what happens next. And my ride is great. Like I could just like fart and manifest shit. Like it's crazy, but it's dangerous. And I don't want to be like opportunistic without being strategic which has served me 
but also not add it up to something to what I, to, to something as meaningful as I think it could have been. Sure. And my next question is like, what's going to be meaningful? Not like hmm. how much money am I, am I going to make? But like 38 to 48 is really different. Like you're pushing 50 and then you're like, fuck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like 28 to 38 is like, okay, cute. You like did all this stuff and none of it was cute, but um, it's just, I feel like it gets more serious and I've like taken my expect, not expectations of my life, but what I want in my life, like, I'll, like personally, some of that like hasn't really like manifested, like having a family being one of them. And now I'm not saying like, I'm not sure if I want one just to like deflect and be like, well, I didn't get what I want. And like, you know, I think people like make excuses and just instead of sounding disappointed, they say like, I'm not sure if I want that, but I literally like, I don't want my future to be a hangover of what I used to want. Sure. Or chasing things that you used to want, but you're not actually sure. Just whether because it is I didn't get them. Yeah, sure. So I'm like, I've really kind of put myself in a place where like, I don't know. And if I do want those things, I want it. And this is what I've, I'm really good at this, but it's also uh, like peeling back layers of the onion. Like, do I want this? Am I influenced by this? You know, am I, do I want this to live up to something culturally or because I want to chase relevance or, um, you know, how is this, how did this enter my mind and why is it, is it still here? Is it not? Is this something I'm attached to because I used to be attached to it? And I've just kind of like leveled everything for myself and I don't have an answer to your question. And I'm kind of at the beginning of like, okay, how, how do I build real resilience? Not the kind of resilience people think I have because I just like keep showing up on podcasts yeah. or whatever. <laughs> like, how can I, how can I build sure. like emotional resilience and how can I build something greater than myself? That isn't just some like flywheel of content or like, you know, people like a business or whatever. There's like more than that. Yeah, you know, it's funny you were describing your life earlier, the the traveling around, the assistant, uh, you know, uh, snow plow in front of you, making sure you never have to struggle with things, yeah. going from meeting to meeting, city to city. And I've had that life, and I've, I've, I've met a lot of people who have had that life. And one of the things that I always feel when I'm getting close to it or when I meet people who have it is I go, this person is very successful, but not very free. Like this person is is in a very nice gilded cage. They are not in control of their schedule. You know, when you meet someone and you're like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, we can get on the phone. You know, you can call me tomorrow at 2.07 p.m. and we can talk until 2.13 p.m. or whatever. And you're just mm -hmm. like, what world do you live in where like mm -hmm. you're, you're scheduling in six minute increments or whatever, you know? That sounds like it sucks. And I, I, I've come to think of freedom or autonomy as the ultimate form of success. And I, I've come to pity people who are very rich and powerful, but have no autonomy. Yeah. There's like, there's a balance there, you know, like I went from in some ways being that person and being super busy and building a company with girl boss and then started business class, which is, you know, online course that we do twice a year. And so I was like, the next thing I want, I don't want to be this undertow of like entrepreneurship where I have a team and I have to like feed the beast all the time. And, you know, I'm trying to bring in revenue. I'm like shipping goods all year round, or I'm trying to like close deals with brand, you know, advertisers yeah. or whatever. And I want things to feel like projects. So I started a business, but I made it feel like a project and the outcome of the business is outsized to the footprint of the business from a human perspective, from an investment perspective, from an effort perspective. And there's a, you know, playbook for that with online courses. And I was like, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. So I'm going to launch this in the spring and enroll students in the spring. And I'm going to enroll students in the fall. And I like want to break for a second. And yeah. it was fall of 2020 that I launched business class. It brought in a million dollars in revenue. And a few months after I started putting the content together, the next year it did, you know, several times more of that bought a house in Kauai. 
And I just like did nothing all summer and it was amazing. But then I went through a breakup and now I'm like, all right, like what am I going to go hang out by myself for months on end in like a a beautiful place? Or am I going to like, you know, use my talents, fill my time and get busy again. And like, not just to fill time, but also like, I want to use my brain. I want to be curious. I want to build things. And also maybe I'm ready to like, Re- regain the confidence it'll take for me to do something bigger and a, 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 a that's a bigger commitment than like an online course that happens twice a year like that fit the thesis of what I wanted then and I have room to do more now and I'm not sure what that looks like and it's going to take more than a strategy it's going to take some personal work as well not to do it like living in fear and like a piece of Swiss cheese that like the, like the wind blows through when like, you know, something happens or like a Roomba looking for like some shit, like just thinking like this might fulfill me. Like it's, it's like you want to be busy, but not too busy. You want to have power, but not too much power. You want to have money, (laughs) but not too much money. Right. It all comes down to, to what the Stokes would call temperance, like the right amount and not, Of some things, no amount is the right amount. Like there's not just the right amount of doing heroin or, you know, being a creep like we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, But but uh, you want you want to you want to be like uh, you want to be like in the league. But I don't know if you want to be LeBron James. Do you know what I mean? Or you don't want to be Tom Brady, probably. Right. Like you don't want to actually be the greatest, best person with the most. You want to have access to all those things and be personally fulfilled without being consumed by it at this catastrophic level. It's just like leading from behind. It's like not, not leading from the front. It's leading your life from behind. Um, it's building a bottom up plan instead of a top down. Um, and the same, you know, with your business, it's not just like, of course you want to shoot for the stars and there you're, there's your top down plan, but you have to temper it with reality. I imagine that's a little weird with, with business class too, because like you've learned how to have a successful business and built, you've learned all these things about the actual like realities of running and uh, you know, succeeding in business. And you have this sort of deeper philosophical and personal understanding where you probably question some of it, where you put it in perspective, et cetera. And so it must be like when you're talking to someone who's 23 and they've got their first business, it must be interesting for you to decide like which of your hats are you going to instruct them with? The one about like, here's how to grow and scale this. And then here's the one about like questioning it and where does it fit in your life and all the sort of larger philosophical No, not lessons. when you're 23. Like, just go. Right. Like, when you're, like, 23, just, like, go, be messy, but also, like, kill your darlings quickly. <laughs> yeah. Like, go have multiple businesses. Don't be attached to what it is that you start. Like, start messy. Iterate, you know, start with a skateboard. Put some, you know, handlebars on it. Then build a seat. And then you have a bicycle, but like, don't start with a bicycle. I feel bad for rich kids. It's hard for them to do that. Yeah. (laughs) I just, I just took my kids to Disneyland. Like, uh, this is day before yesterday. And like, we had to make this decision about like, you can hire a guide at Disneyland that takes you around and you don't have to wait in any of the lines. Uh And it was like, do we do that or not? And I was like, cause I don't want to wait in a line. Right. And, uh, but they should probably wait in line. I've waited in the Disneyland lines, you know, out my whole life. And, uh, so we didn't, and then we flew home on Southwest. So I, I feel like it was character building. You did it. We did not do it. We, we didn't did, do it. We didn't wait. We, we, we didn't pay for the guide. Uh, you know, I probably bought them more toys than my parents would have ever bought me at Disneyland. There's a fast pass thing on the app. Now you can like buy your way into, and here's the trick. Cause you have multiple tickets on there. Yeah. You can book like three people on one ride and be on the wait list for that for like a few hours later and then book one other person for a different ride yeah. or two and two. It's easier with two yeah. people to be like, I'm booked on this. You're booked on that. And then you go to the one that's like the earlier one and you're like, boop, scan the barcode. And then you boop the other person's one. And you're like, what happened? 
like, why? Oh my God. I thought we both signed up for this one and they're like, whatever, just go through. Well, that that's that's very genius. Like an we, adult we did who scams Disneyland. <laughs> we, we 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 paid for the app, so we we got like some fast passes. But the guide thing, you can just do any ride. Oh, it's, and it's no so expensive. Thing. I did that on New Year's one day. Like yeah. my friends all stayed over. We were super hungover. I had the kind of assistant that could like literally yeah. just call Disneyland, and be like, you know, hours later, like yeah. we show up and there's a guide, and we just like went on everything. But that was many many years ago. We kept it small and then like, uh, but then we ordered room service in the hotel, which my parents would have like never done. And my, did my you kids stay at the Grand Californian? No, it was booked up. So we were in a, you know, in a uh, Hilton Garden Inn uh, down the street. Again, all, all character building on, on purpose. Mm -hmm. Good job. Yeah. You know, you try, you try. But, but I think the, the, the one I struggle with more is like, they're like, can I have that? And I'm like, I don't give a shit. You can have a churro, you know, like, uh, or you can have this Lego set. I think, I think I probably buy them too much stuff and that's probably not the best lesson. I think that's wasteful. I think it matters less like about whatever, but just like, don't make too much. Don't, don't make too much garbage. No, that's that, the bigger lesson for yes. your children is like, this is also, it's like, you're the guy who's like, would know, would understand like dead weight more than anyone, you know, know, like meaningless stuff, like in your life, you're not Marie Kondo, but also like, it's just a funny contrast. That's all. No, it is. It is. We, I, I've talked about this. We just, uh, speaking of hiring people, we had to like hire an organizer to like, just come and organize our stuff because one, I, we buy too much stuff for the kids, but also like, I don't know about if you've experienced this is very first world, but people just mail me shit. And then I feel bad throwing it away, but it just, it fills up my life. You know what I mean? Like not just, not just books. I mean, I get thousands of books that I didn't ask for, but people just mail me stuff. And I, I'm like, feel bad throwing it away or even giving it away. And then it's just there. And uh, I had to yeah. bring someone in to clear it all out. You gotta like donate stuff. Yes, that's what I do, but it's still weird. Well, this is a weird note to end on, but we should, we should call it. <laughs> yeah, don't buy shit. I mean, that's yes. like, that's the moral of the story. Temperance. It is, With but shit. it takes discipline because when you can afford to, and it's a rounding error, it feels inconsequential to buy it, but it's not inconsequential. Mm -hmm. It does all add up. It does. It, 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 both in your house, in the landfill, and uh, everywhere yeah. else. Well, this is amazing. I hope we can meet sometime. I know. Let me know next time you're at Disneyland. I, I will. I will. We'll get, well, <laughs> if you get enough people, it starts to make sense to get the guide. I know. You need like 10. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. So you, well, I'll put you down for the next time we go to Disneyland. All right. <laughs>